Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted in a hybrid model. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom, is being recorded, and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. Uh, we will begin this evening with the FY24 budget hearing. If there is anyone here or on Zoom who would like to make a comment regarding the FY24 budget, you can raise your hand here in the space or on Zoom. Ms. Diggins is checking. All right, seeing none, I will close our FY24 budget hearing. The next item on our agenda is public comment. <clears throat> uh, before we call our first speaker, I have a few ground rules. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 20 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. Uh, I will let the speaker know when they have 30 seconds left. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 20 minutes, the number of speakers may be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera if possible while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy, BEDH, that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such objective criticisms of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of Arlington Public Schools. The public is reminded that the school committee does not hold jurisdiction over the performance of school personnel other than the superintendent. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that might identify and or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. Um, we have one person signed up for public comment this evening, Ms. Hall. Thank you, Liz. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Julie Hall, and I live at 189 Jason Street. Can you hear me? Is that good? Yes. Okay. Um, in Massachusetts, sexual education is not required, and I applaud APS for teaching the Great Body Shop in grades K through 5 in past years. I believe all children should understand their bodies and receive age-appropriate sexual education in order to become healthy and informed adults. Um, recently, as in yesterday, I filed an official objection to the new curriculum that is being taught by PE teachers on gender identity to grades four this month um, and potentially lower grades next year. It's not age appropriate, nor is it based on scientific data. I'm fully aware that your goal is to teach in a manner that is inclusive to all students, and I support this goal. Unfortunately, the lessons in human growth and development no longer focus on the specific changes of the female and male body. The Procter & Gamble video, Always Changing and Growing Up, co-ed puberty education, was removed from the 118-23 curriculum slides because it used the terms male and female. Instead, boy and girl body changes are grouped together, oh, I'm sorry. Instead, boy and girl body changes are, are grouped together on one slide. The Great Body Shop stated that a female's hips will widen and females may experience puberty one to two years before males. Factual statements like this will no longer be taught in this manner. According to Landon Callahan, DESE consultant for Safe Schools, the terms boy and girl should not be spoken during the presentation and should be replaced with person with a vulva, person with a vagina, and person with a penis. I think most children and parents will find it ridiculous for the words boy and girl to be forbidden. 
My understanding is that Mr. Callahan has a degree in media communications, but not in education or curriculum design. APS has adopted the National Sex Education Standards, second edition, 2020, which does not align with the great body shop referenced on page 50 of the elementary handbook. I have reviewed the great body shop unit offered to fifth graders in the spring of 2021. There's no traces of it in the new human growth and development curriculum, in my opinion. According to Sex Ed for Social Change, Massachusetts does not require sex education, but instead allows local school boards to make such decisions. If a community decides to implement sex education, General Law of Massachusetts, Chapter 71, 380, requires that standards be developed with the guidance of community stakeholders, including parents and at least one physician. I'm disappointed with the manner in which this education material has been revised and ask that you reconsider the material that is currently being taught in grade four and possibly to lower grades next year. Thank you for your time on this matter. Our next item on the agenda, <clears throat> AHS student representatives to the school committee. Oh. All right, uh, I mean, the sports seasons have been winding down the winter sports. Uh, the hockey team is like destroying it. They're, they're doing amazing. There's a game <laughs> tonight, I believe. Um, but most other sports, they like are in tournaments or uh, in like the final championships. Uh, I believe wrestling did well. Um, school events, we, uh, there's a junior and senior spring fling going on in a few weeks, and I'm excited for that. I think a lot of the school is. It's a nice like precursor to prom, and proms have been announced. Things are being planned. Everything is going well. Thank you very much. All right, the next item on our agenda is an athletic department presentation. Mr. Bowler. Do you want to say anything, Dr. Hunt? I can't at the end. I'm going to pull up your slides, okay. um, and you can sort of signal to me when you want me to advance. Okay. Hold on one second. <clears throat> uh, first of all, yes, thank you for letting me come speak here today. and. You know, thank you, you know, uh, for everyone here that made it possible to, um, you know, have no athletic fees this year. I think it's been huge for our students and the families of Arlington. Um, you know, it's, it's unbelievable, and it's, thank you. I know it's a lot of hard work went into it, and, um, you know, our, our students and our parents really do appreciate it, so thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just uh, going to go to the next slide. Um, I just kind of did a comparison. You know, we're, we have, we're um, from fall 21 to fall 22. 22, you know, we were up, you know, 42 more students played sports this season. We had well over 520 kids try out for sports this year. Um, girls volleyball and football you know, had the biggest <coughs> jumps um, in the fall season from 51 to 67, 53 to 65. Uh, in the fall, it didn't change any of non-cut sports. All our non-cut sports was still cut sports even with um, no user fees. Um, and those were cross country, field hockey, football, and, and girls swimming. Uh, the cut sports for the fall were cheering, golf, boys soccer, girls soccer, and girls volleyball. Um, and I don't see, for the fall, I don't see, you know, that, you know, any cuts coming in the non-cut sports. In the past, if we've had more people do cross country, we've been fortunate enough to add another coach. Um, so I don't think any, in the fall, no, no cut sport will become a cut sport because of user fees. In the winter, you know, uh, again, another big jump up, you know, from 357 last year to uh, 391 this year. You know, wrestling went from 24 students to 44, which is a huge jump. They, you know, they finished second in the sectional this year, won the Middlesex League title for the fifth straight season, undefeated in the Liberty League. Um, you know, Coach Cummings does a great job, and, you know, um, a huge jump in sports, and they're, they're very thankful for having no athletic fees. And, and it, it will never be a cut sport. It might be something where we look into adding another coach to help out with wrestling. Um, but, you know, wrestling will always, you know, maintain it and be, not, be a non-cut sport. Also, alpine skiing went from 17 students to 31 students, uh, which was a great jump. You know, they had four kids um, compete, make it to the state, um, the state meet this week, which was uh, outstanding. Um, you know, it, I mean, it's a huge jump. It's a, you know, the program's only been here for a few years, and it's just growing and growing. Um, the non-cut sports for the winter were alpine ski, 
indoor track, winter chair, um, boys swimming and wrestling, um, cut sports, uh, you know, for basketball, gymnastics, and hockey. And I don't see any of that, you know, changing. I, like I said, I think we could just add more coaches if we got more students to attend. So basically, we had, you know, so far this year we've had 692 students participate in one of the two seasons. 173 competed in both, which is about 45% of our students, and that hasn't included the, the spring. So I think we're going to be well over 50% of our student bodies will be playing athletics. Uh, the non-cut sports for last spring are going to be the same this year, outdoor track, lacrosse, softball, boys volleyball, the cut sports, baseball, boys tennis, and girls tennis. Um, next one, yep. Next slide. Uh, so we've had a lot of success so far this fall and winter. You know, we've had seven teams, you know, win, uh, Middlesex League Liberty or Freedom Division champions, boys cross country, girls cross country, boys soccer, girls swimming, boys basketball, boys ice hockey, and wrestling. You know, ten teams qualified for the state tournament, uh, boys cross country, girls cross country cheer, boys soccer, girls soccer, field hockey, boys basketball, boys ice hockey. Uh, which is playing right now. Girls ice hockey had a big win yesterday and uh, is playing on Sunday uh, in wrestling. And seven teams had, you know, um, students com uh, compete at the state uh, level um, in the MIA. Alpine ski, boys and girls swim, and boys and girls outdoor track and gymnastics had and students compete uh, in the state meets. So, you know, so far it's you know, been a you know, great year and, um, you know, sign up for the spring. We have right now over 250 kids signed up for the spring. Uh, it's two weeks left in sign up, so uh, I think we'll get up to probably 400 students uh, for the spring as well. So, but I think, you know, thank you again for, you know, not having athletic fees has been, I think, a huge for our programs and for our students, um, you know, letting them play multiple sports. Uh, I think it's, you know, a lot of kids, you know, might play one sport, but having no user fees, I think we're going to, in the, in the future, we'll have kids playing two, three, multiple sports, because, uh, you know, I think it's just, you know, it's great for them to be with their, with their um, the student body and uh, competing for Arlington High School. Thank you. Any questions yeah. or comments from the committee? Mr. Hainer? I, I'm sure you're doing it already, but there is communication between the uh, coaches and the teachers to make sure that the students are keeping up with their academics as well. Yep, 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 yep. We, I mean, I talk, like, I, I, I look at the grades and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's all, you know, academic eligibility that, you know, we, we definitely work on with, um, if, if a student's having an issue, you know, we at our dean's meetings, we'll talk about it and I'll, I'll bring it to the coach's attention. And we, we never will stop a kid from, um, you know, kids are allowed to miss practice if, they, if they're getting extra help in school or if they need anything. Uh, you know, that's the, that's the priority and, um, you, know, um, you know, we'll definitely work with students because. Uh, I didn't mean that as a criticism. I think yeah. you're doing a heck of a job. Thank you. Thank I you. just want everyone else to know that. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. There. Thank you. Thank you. Schluckman. Okay, I, I, I'm really, really pleased that uh, participation is up um, with the elimination of fees. Uh, I sort of have a hypothesis that some of those kids are kids who might be sort of interested in the sport but may not feel they're good enough to go into it if there is that expense involved. But if you offer a free shot without having a user fee attached to it, they, they might be more uh, willing to take a chance on it. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, I think, I think um, more with like the non-cut sports, I think like, because um, we, we never have them pay the fee mm -hmm. until like they make the roster so in the past. So I think, I think having the non-cut sports have been huge because, it, you know, mm -hmm. I think some students won't try out for sports if the you know if they're nervous about getting cut. Where we have you know every season we have multiple opportunities for them mm -hmm. to play a sport and be on a team as long as as long as they you know they, they show up every day and work hard you know they can be part of an athletic team every single season at Arlington High School. Yeah, I think it's really important to to build the community and and I love the way that kids in Arlington can move, say, from football in the fall to theater in the spring. There's just a, a lot of uh, groups mingling across what normally would be divides in high schools. Oh, yeah. No, I think, I think you know, like I grew up here and, mm -hmm. um, and you know, I graduated in 1993 and, I mean, every, every student, you know, played multiple sports mm -hmm. uh, back then. And I think, you know, it started to get away with keep people were specializing in a sport, but I think, you know, with having no user fees, I think we're going to be bringing back Know, kids playing two, you know, two, two seasons, three seasons, which I think 
you know, it's, it's great. Cause, you know, I think specializing in sports is, is, is good as well, but I think playing in different, um, different sports is going to prepare you better in life. And it'll prepare you better in the sport you want to, um, that you, you know, you, the sport that may be your, your top sport. Because, you know, you, every, every time you step on a field or a court, there's different uh, experiences you, you can, you can, you're going to get, and you can bring that back to every sport and, and you know, also in, in your life as well. That's a support structure. You have a group that's caring for you during the day. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the report. I'm really just so thrilled to see the numbers increase, and I'm hoping that we even get bigger and better numbers next year. Yeah, I think we, we, we're adding Nordic ski, mm -hmm. uh, another another sport that would be a non-cut sport for the winter. So I think it's uh, yeah, it's great. This, thank you, Mr. Thielman. Uh, thanks for the report, John. Yeah. My question: Could you sort of share with the public how you're managing uh, the field use in the spring and in the fall, given the construction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's it's definitely challenging. You know, we have. Um, you know um, the one turf field, so it's. I mean, the coaches are doing a great, a great job, and they'll continue for the next couple of years to do it. Um, like, you know, especially in the in the fall, like you know, sometimes football will be on half the field with with boys soccer, and then girls soccer on half the field with um, field hockey, and it's um, you know they just do a good job, you know, working together. Um, you know, we try to give you know each team different you know times when they're on the turf by themselves, but you know we want we also don't want kids here till ten o'clock at night, so. Uh, you know, I think we're working the best we can, uh, you know, with the one turf field we have in Arlington. Um, and then, you know, we also use some of the other fields in Arlington as well. But I think it's, um, you know, it just shows, I mean, the coaches are doing a great job being able to, you know, um, organize their practice for half a field, full field. And, um, you know, and the kids are very understanding that, you know, this, this is how it is right now. And then once, you know, once it's all done, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, but, the, you know, in, in, the, in the spring will be the same way. Like, you know, start the spring until like last week. I thought we would our teams would be on the field. You know, March. You know, March 20th. But now it will be, you know, baseball, softball will be like in the gym slash using the turf with you know track and girls across, boys across. Um, so I mean, they they just do a great job. You know, the, the coaches you know working with each other and creating a you know structure where the, um, the kids n know the practice schedule way in advance. But um, with you know the limited spaces we have right now, you know get to get their job done. Thanks, Mr. Card. Um, thank you. So thanks for for adding alpine ski and, and creating the other non-cut opportunities. Um, as, as we look forward, you know, now that we're a larger high school and with the increased demand for sport without the fees, the um, besides the unified sports, the other sport we don't have is rugby. Yep. And then there's been talk of adding boys field hockey. Do we have any thoughts about either of those in the future? Yeah, I mean, um, boy, like uh, field hockey for boys, we um, it's something we definitely can look can look at. Like this this past year, we had uh, two boys on the um, on the field hockey team, uh, but it's definitely something if we have the interest to, um, to create a team. Uh, and yeah, rugby, I definitely can look into maybe send a survey out. Um, I haven't had anyone come to me and ask about rugby yet, but I mean, it's definitely I can send a survey out mm -hmm. um, to students yeah, to see I if they. I think there's a new um, uh, middle school group doing rugby in town, yeah. so it might, yeah. be, might be, might yeah, be yeah, no, yeah, definitely I can send a survey out to see who would be interested in, um, in hip styling a rugby <coughs> team. I know Belmont has a very successful rugby team, but it's, so I can definitely um, talk to them as well to see how they, they started their program. Great, thanks. Ms. Morgan. Um, can you speak a little bit to the, um, the assistant athletic director position that was added and like what that's meant for your department and your position and the people that you support? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Rich, Rich is Rich is doing a great job. Rich, um, you know, he, he you know he does a lot with um, transportation. Um, you know, he was uh, you know, he, um, transportation helping with registration, um, covering games at night. Uh, weekends, um, you know, um, you know, getting stuff ready for banquets, um, varsity letters, um, you know, just kind of he, he, he does a little bit of everything, um, you know, that the, the, the old admin assistant used to do, plus like covering games, you know, you know, um, you know, on different sports, watching, watching coaches, um, you know, he had a background in coaching at the college level, junior college level. Um, in private school level, um, so he, I mean, he's just been he's been great. You know, I mean, he was he was a, an athletic director at um, high school in Vermont for five years. So it's it's really like a partnership between me and him um, that it's been great. Where I can you know bounce back information on him, questions, and um, you know he, he's just been great. Where he can 
you know, cover games at night and, um, you know, we can alternate or both be at events, um, you know, because I think we, 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 get, we get a lot of great crowd support, so having multiple people at events has been, been huge. That's great. And I guess just my other piece of feedback would just be to continue to sort of build out and work on that athletics website. It seems to live on Google, so it doesn't, I don't, I don't know where, it, how it, like, I mean, I'm sure it's linked to, like, but I, I don't know if you have more ability to just, you know, keep it updated with, you know, sharing about sports that are, are no-cut sports. I get yeah. questions from parents all yeah. the time, like, oh, is my kid going to get cut from cross-country? And, like, the answer is like usually not and I you know I appreciate that it would be hard to be like like for swimming for example if you had 50 kids come out for swimming right. y kids would get cut because there's just only so many yep. you know water molecules they can yep. swim in yep. right 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 um, but I think you know as much information as as you can provide um, will only you know give people the information they have to feel comfortable you yep. know signing up yep. so thank you so much yep, no thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I don't know if you're aware, but there's a warrant article on this year's town meeting for this year's town meeting that asks for a moratorium on the building of new turf fields. And I won I know we don't have our new one. Our new turf fields won't be ready for another what year and a half or something. But I was wondering if you could speak to how things will be with them versus without them. Yeah, so I mean, having the having the turf fields will be um, be huge because we, you know, um, we have to, you know, in, in the in, in the in the fall, um, you know, varsity games are on the turf. That you know, freshman and JV games are you know at different Thorndike fields, Spy Pond. So. Uh, we've had to cancel a lot of those games just because the field's wet, can't, it's un unplayable, where once we have the fields back here, you know, we can have, you know, all our sub-varsity teams will be able, if it rains, we can, we can put them on the turf here. Um, um, and so we, we basically, they'll get to play more games um, mm -hmm. as well. It's in, in, the, in, the, the, in the spring, too, like baseball and, and softball, you know, basically a lot of times they'll, they'll be, they're in the gym the first two weeks of practice where it's, it's really hard to, to do your tryouts for baseball and softball in a gym. Um, and so now with the turf fields, I mean, they're going to be day one that, you know, they'll be out there on the turf, um, you know, and it will definitely give us an advantage over most of the teams uh, in our league. I mean, most, most of them don't have turf besides Winchester and like Watertown uh, for their baseball and softball fields. So I think it will just give more, it will give more opportunity for kids to, you know, play every day and basically, you know, um, depending, you know, with, with the fields, uh, with the weather, if the town closing fields when the weather's bad, um, you know, and with, you know, be able to play longer at night as well. Thanks. That's really helpful. We may want, we may ask through the superintendent um, for some information for you, from you for a town meeting, depending on how things go. But that, that's really helpful for us. Thank you. I um, I know you want to get to that game. Uh, can you just share a little bit about what factors lead to a sport being a non-cut sport versus a cut sport? I heard you saying you could add coaches. Why can't you add coaches for some of the cut sports? Or uh, you know, swimming. There's not enough lanes in a pool. Yeah. So like it's like it's like um, so basketball. You can have you can you can have like at the most 15 kids on your roster. So like. So JV, a varsity could have 15, JV 15, and freshman 15. So like, if we wanted to go more than that, we'd probably try to have to add another team where you know most you know in the league there's there's, there's like a you know a varsity a varsity level of JV and freshman we'd have to be looking for other other <coughs> other games which would, would be difficult. Um, so like it's basically there's roster limits. I'm trying to think um, hockey there's a certain amount of kids that can be on each team. Um, um, Boys and girls soccer, you can only have so many on a team. Where um, you know we have we have three levels of that, um, so like we have to I mean adding another team and trying to find them like games would be difficult uh, compared to like cross country, indoor track, um, even like like field like field hockey right now we have we have two levels. So if we if we get a lot of kids to sign up, we can add uh, a freshman team or a JVB team. Um, so that's why that's a non cut sport. So I mean, but. If, if we had 80 kids trial field hockey, then they, you know, that could be a cut sport. But I, I mean, I, I, 
that wouldn't happen anytime soon. Thank you. No, that's helpful information. As yep. Ms. Morgan mentioned families are asking, yep. you know, which sport. So just knowing why some are and some are not. Madam Chair, can I ask a quick follow-up? Yes. If you're doing a survey, could you also add cricket to the list? Because I see that being played on fields in Arlington. Okay. Yeah, I can definitely sure. do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. cricket and yep. Mm -hmm. I think also, uh, am I thinking about pickleball too? <laughs> so I think that's another. Sport I think it's that, an old that could come, could come down the road. So, Dr. Omi. I just want to say thank you for all of the work that you do. All of our leaders put in a lot of hours, but I can find John down by the fields on a Friday evening, like every week. So um, I know how much care and time you put in. I'm glad you have the assistant director to help you build out some of that capacity as our teams expand. And it has been really wonderful. We know that when kids are connected to an extracurricular, it connects mm -hmm. them better to school and they perform mm -hmm. better academically. And the hard work you and your team put in contributes to that along with all the other extracurriculars we offer. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Head to that game. <laughs> All right, Monotomy Preschool. Dr. Hellman, I don't know if you want to. Welcome, Monotomy. It's my understanding that they have not done a presentation to the school committee before, so I'm so excited that they're here <laughs> to tell you about the amazing programming that they do. I'm going to pull up your slides, and when you want me to advance, if I don't, automatically just okay. give me a nod. And if you switch speakers, you just have to switch. Switch the thing? Okay. Hold on a sec, I'm struggling with my slides. All right. Um, so thank you, Dr. Holman, for inviting us to speak tonight. Um, for those that don't know me, I'm Joy Schlanger. I'm the Early Childhood Coordinator. And um, with me today are three members of our instructional leadership team. Um, Carrie Simino, the lead teacher, and uh, Lena Knightley, social worker, here in person with me and on um, Zoom over there, is C. Ferranti, one of our integrated preschool teachers. Mm -hmm. um, we are really excited to tell you about Monotomy Preschool. Um, tonight we're going to talk about um, our priorities and our key initiatives and tell you about um, Monotomy. Um, go ahead. Yep. Um, Monotomy Preschool is where the district's youngest learners go to learn, grow, um, and laugh. And we currently, we have, well, now we have 98 students, both with and without disabilities, um, in our classroom programs. And additionally, we have about 27 students coming in for weekly related services. Um, academically, we use evidence-based curriculums. Um, at Monotomy, we're using a pre-reading curriculum called Lively Letters, as well as a writing curriculum, um, which is um, Learn for Success, and Mathematics is Building Blocks, and um, our social-emotional lessons are from Second Step. Um, yeah, in 2017, we were invited um, by DESE to participate in the Pyramid a Model, which is a voluntary initiative. Um, there are about 37 districts across Massachusetts using the pyramid model. Um, the pyramid model is a positive behavior intervention support framework um, geared towards early childhood to promote social and emotional competence in young children. Um, the pyramid model practices are evidence-based and researched to be effective with all human beings, both with and without disabilities. I don't know, Liz, if you can click on the hyperlink or not. Which one? The pyramid model one. This one? Just to show the, like, the pyramid, I guess. Um, so looking at the pyramid, it's similar to the MTSS pyramid, where the base of the pyramid includes um, support for every child. Um, and within the, within the pyramid framework, this looks like um, creating supportive, responsive relationships among adults um, and children to promote healthy social and emotional development. Um, and then also talk, continuing with the base of the pyramid, can you go back to the slides? Um, continuing with the base of the pyramid, we support um, all of our students by, we've created program-wide expectations, which are, um, we are kind, we are safe, and we are engaged. And under these broad categories, um, we define what kind, safe, and engaged look like in all settings of our preschool. On the slide, you'll see a, um, an example of our classroom expectations, but we have similar posters throughout the building and in classrooms that break down behavior <coughs> expectations for recess, um, the hallway, the bathroom, um, et cetera. And these expectations are continuously taught in classrooms and promote positive um, behaviors throughout our program. Um, and then you don't need to go back to the hyperlink, but thinking about the pyramid, the second um, tier of the pyramid focuses on teaching social skills directly to students who require additional support. Um, this could come into play for students whose social and emotional skills are not progressing with the implementation of the base supports. 
Um, and this looks like um, could be small social skill groups that um, Elena, our social worker, does, or direct teaching of skills by our classroom teachers. Um, and then the top of the pyramid includes even more individualized behavior supports or um, special education evaluation if needed. And uh, beyond the use of the pyramid model to support our students, we also support our families by offering a parent workshop. We're about to start our fourth session of the eight-week um, parent workshop series called Positive Solutions for Parents. Um, this workshop aligns with the pyramid model and is developed by the Center on Social Emotional Foundations for Early Learning. It's designed um, to help parents and caregivers promote their child's social and emotional development and to better understand young children's challenging behaviors. Um, you can go ahead and change the slide. Um, so through our newly created this is, um, instructional leadership team, we looked at how our priorities fit within the Arlington Public Schools vision of belonging, growth, joy, and empowerment. Um, you can go ahead and switch it, Liz. Um, so our, we prioritize belonging, um, diversity, and inclusion, and knowing the importance of building relationships with students and the importance of students feeling as though they belong and are being able to see themselves in classrooms. This, um, this year we're taking a close look at our classroom libraries and we want to increase the number of diverse books we have. Um, we're also, we also know that just by adding books to the libraries is not enough, therefore we're examining our curriculum pacing guide and our curriculums and making sure that our classroom themes and lessons um, support all learners. Oh, go ahead. And then um, we also prioritize the use of the principles for, um, for, design, for universal design for learning throughout our program. Um, for example, <coughs> all students have access to low-tech alternative communication devices to help students increase and grow their language. As we watch our children um, grow throughout the year, we prioritize working with our elementary partners to ensure that the transition to kindergarten goes smoothly for not just the students, but for their families. And um, we'll continue to provide ongoing professional learning for paraprofessionals, teachers, and related service providers. Uh, we'll also utilize our internal and external pyramid model coaches to work with classroom teams around inclusion and equity and to ensure that the pyramid model practices are being implemented. And of course, it is preschool, so joy is a priority. <laughs> Go ahead, Liz. Um, we prioritize joyful learning. Um, we have the honor of being the first entry into Arlington Public Schools for many families. Um, our panorama school climate results are above 90% favorable um, in the fall. And um, through a grant, we've been able to add a music teacher weekly. And thanks to doc Dr. Homan, Mr. Mason, and the cabinet and the school committee, we were able to add an art teacher to our program this past year. So thank you very much for that. Um, you can switch it. We're also underway. Um, currently providing professional development for our classroom teams, including learning sessions for our paraprofessionals and coaching by our internal and external pyramid model coaches. Um, beyond our pyramid model trainings, um, I've mentioned that we're gonna diversify our classroom libraries and hope by the end of the year to redesign the pacing guide for the next school year. We're also really excited in preparing our return to the high school. Oh, we're excited about that. And um, if you wanna switch it, uh, we continue to continue our work around diversity and equity, we're going to work with Margaret Creedle Thomas so she can help us create um, PD geared towards early childhood. Um, and finally, I'd really like to thank, take the opportunity to thank Dr. Homan, Allison Elmer, Michael Mason, and members of the cabinet and this committee for supporting the proposed budget and helping us decrease the salary differential between our integrated teaching assistants and specialized um, support personnel. Um, so thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. You can, there's one more slide. <laughs> and if you Q. can tell, it's a Q and an A. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you very thank you. much. Um, questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Cardin? Uh, I'm really glad to see you present here. Um, my son is a proud graduate of uh, Monotomy, and uh, I mean, he joined, I think, maybe a year or two after APS took over the preschool. And so you've come such a long way back from then when it was just sort of <laughs> two <laughs> classrooms and three and you were adding classrooms left and right and now yeah. you have some structure and you're doing professional development. I'm, happy, I'm thrilled to see the art teacher and the music teacher. Those are all great developments. And you've kept the staff. Um, yes. <laughs> been there, which, is, which is awesome. So good work, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about how you find those 27 kiddos who come in for related services? I had one of those like a number of years ago, and I, but I always think of myself as being sort of like on the aggressive end of the spectrum. So I probably was like, he turned three and I don't think he can talk well enough and we're here, you know, but how do you find, like I, I appreciate, you know, how you would bring in sort of preschool kids, but then there's there are also these kids who aren't gonna qualify to go to monotomy, but they're still, they still do need services, yeah. and the more that can be done before they get to kindergarten, the better, right? right? The better for all of us right. for, for pre-K through 12. So, how, like, how, I mean, some of them come from early intervention, yeah. obviously, because right. that's a, you know, and that's a warm handoff. Right. But right. what about kids who weren't in early, inter like, how do yeah. we find those kids? We find them, well, sometimes through pediatricians, where the pediatricians might ask the parents to call the school. We also do screenings um, throughout the year, and we advertise the screenings with the um, private preschools in, in Arlington and beyond Arlington. We, we advertise the screenings within Arlington, but we also get phone calls from parents. Um, they seem, we, the, their preschools might tell them to speak with the school, the public school, so we have, we get referrals from Preschools all over, not just Arlington. Um, parents have their kids in preschools in Lexington and Cambridge and um, lots of different places. So that's how that's another way that we get referrals. What about kids who aren't in preschool? So uh, we have our child find obligation, so we have right. to publicly post um, every year that any resident of Arlington, age three and above, um, if you suspect that your child has a disability. So that's available through, we post it in the newspaper, and as she said, we share those postings with pediatrician's office. We share them with the private preschools and home daycares. Um, and again, it's also listed on our websites. So that's considered our child find responsibility. And that's for all students ages three and up. For residents of Arlington, I, I, I'm sure we're meeting our like minimum mm -hmm. obligations. I'm just wondering, like, you know, I mean, yeah, because they're they're probably out there, right? Because mm -hmm. we find them when they come to kindergarten. So um, that's not, that's I, you know, I think as we, you know, as as we think about a welcome center and and all mm -hmm. of those, you know, kind of pieces that right. are like feel like they're really coming together within the district as as a whole. I, I'm confident that all of you will advocate for, yeah. for the needs of, of your students. And um, if um, so, I'm excited for us to be able and to I'm going to add to that, if you don't mind. We oh, yeah. also are part of the, um, the Arlington Family Access Community, which is Arlington, Woburn, Burlington. And so they provide free groups and social opportunities to children from birth to five years old that are not in any sort of educational structured setting. Um, and through that, you know, continued collaboration and cooperation, we get um, referrals for kids who may come into gr a weekly group, um, things like that where they're not in a structured preschool setting. Um, so continuing those relationships with, say, a Head Start who do see kids at, from when they're toddler years, going to preschool, um, fostering those relationships and community collaborations. We are getting referrals from other um, places, not just the preschool setting. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. um, our related service providers also have just a little time available mm -hmm. to go into the public, um, private preschools. And so they go in whenever there's a question about something, as long as we have parent permission, of course, but they can go and work with the staff in the private preschools around town um, to help them identify these children also and to help educate them on their respective fields, whether it be social work um, or PT, OT, speech and language, those kinds of things. Um, our staff has also in the past offered um, workshops for these private programs for the teachers and the teaching staff in these private programs to educate them on the up and coming um, um, practices that we use um, within their respective fields. Mr. Schlickman. Just as an early childhood elementary person and principal, um, People I talk to who have experienced your program are just really, really happy with it. Uh, and I think it's one of these crown jewels of the system. I'm looking forward to uh, your move into the new facility. 
uh, and over on Millbrook Drive. And uh, I hope it all goes well for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So do we. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for coming and sharing all of this. I think it's really important for the committee and the community to hear about all the important work that you are doing for our youngest uh, APS student. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Homan, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, this is, I, I love visiting Monotomy. It's one of my favorite places to go. Um, I am, in, I, I'm amused by the fact that by the time I move into, we move into our new offices, I will not have a preschooler anymore. I like almost that exact moment. Um, and if I did, I would just be so happy to send my own little ones to mm -hmm. Monotomy because it is a caring, loving place and mm -hmm. the instruction is top notch every mm -hmm. time I visit. So thank you for everything that you do. We deeply appreciate you and nice job. Thank you. Thank and, you and please come visit us anytime. 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 We love to have visitors. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have our K-12 mathematics update with Mr. Coleman, who is on Zoom. Yes. Ms. Diggins, can, oh, I think, Mr. Coleman, I think you're on mute, and I'm going to ask Ms. Diggins if she can make the um, speaker. Oh, well, okay. Doesn't matter because she should be able to pin pin him. <laughs> Perfect. So we'll be talking about both math and computer science. Um, I'll be efficient with the time. Uh, just let me know. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Wait one. Just wait one second. Okay. Oh. Oh, wait. oh no. No. <laughs> okay. Never mind. I think you could swap it, but that's it. Oh. Unpin. <laughs> Unpin. Unpin. Hold on. How about a multi pin? No. Right. Not a multi pin? This will work. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I probably look better as a smaller um, little box, anyways. <laughs> so um, thanks for for giving me some time for tonight. I appreciate the chance to be remote, juggling uh, the the schedules of my two kids, uh, and and just everything has been a little bit uh, tough. So this has been. I appreciate this. It's great great flexibility. So. Um, First off, just to start, thanks for the support throughout all the years. You know, over the past two years, we haven't asked for a whole lot, but what we've been doing in the department, how we've been shifting and changing has really been helpful. So from, from myself and a lot of the teachers, all the teachers really in the department, I really appreciate all of the support um, that we've been given. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, over the past two years, last year and also this year, I've been lucky to be part of the, the team that was developing the new vision and mission statement. Uh, and I'll talk a little about, about it as well, that the team that was developing the strategic plan. And for me, being part of this was super helpful. One, it allowed me to really be on the ground for advocating what we were seeing in the math and computer science department and ensuring some of those messages, ensuring some of those ideas were part of the, the mission. And what it also did was it allowed me to understand where we were going while this was happening and bring some of those ideas back into the department, which was fantastic. So this is honestly something that at this point, the math department, the computer science department, they're well-versed in this. They, they understand. Like I have seen over the past year and a half, a movement away from uh, the general rundown of the pandemic to a staff that's really picking it up. And the one aspect, and this is gonna come up repeatedly throughout this, uh, the teacher leadership, the engagement, um, what the teachers are, are willing to, to do and be part of right now has been awesome. Like they really are embracing the idea of all learners. They are embracing it not only for their students, but themselves. They're just active participants throughout the whole uh, district. And I'm really appreciative of that. So throughout this presentation, I'm going to be throwing some kudos to some teachers who've really gone, gone above and beyond. So that'll be part of this as well. Um, next slide, please. So. 
I'm displaying this, being part of the strategic planning team, again, was really advantageous to me. Um, these three uh, aspects of priority one are, are aspects that are guiding principles, guiding goals, guiding work for what we're going to be doing. So as this presentation is going through, just be aware of the fact that a lot of it is going to tie back to these. In terms of organization, it might be a little bit different than the way in which I presented before about department goals and things like that. A lot of our work might be embedded within school improvement plans, which is great. It's just organized a little bit differently. But I just wanted to kind of throw this out here because a lot of this, while I'm talking, I'm going to be tying it back to either 1.1, 1.2, or 1.3. Um, all of our work right now and over the next couple of years, we're already uh, aligning it with these three parts of it. So it's been great. Again, I, you know, Dr. Holman, I appreciate being uh, given the opportunity to be part of these teams. It's really allowed me to be uh, put in a position where leading the department, this is much more ingrained in what we're doing already. Um, so thank you. Next slide. So the next couple of slides, the way I've organized this presentation, I'm going to start out with just general updates, things that are tied to some prior goals, uh, things that are tied to um, new additions, funding, things like that. Uh, I'm going to switch and pivot to where we might be going next. And I wanted to end off the presentation with the focus on computer science. Uh, that's an area that I think we have to have a little bit more focus on over the next couple of years. And then we'll have a time for questions and answers at the end. So the, I'm going to go through quick little updates for each of the grade bands and then go from there. So elementary update, just real fast. 1.1 uh, is about high quality instruction. So that tier one instruction, ensuring that we have good, robust instruction at the elementary level. The coaches are, are flying. They're doing a great job, the math coaches. I've been so appreciative of their engagement with the, the individual coaching cycles with the teachers, uh, their new um, work with the district PD. This past year, the elementary coaching team offered professional development. They're currently offering something on what we're calling strengths-based professional, strengths-based teaching and mathematics. Uh, we did uh, a session on problem solving in the beginning. And then we also did a K, K through 12 session on an idea called building thinking classrooms which is uh, about developing student voice and student agency. And they were so instrumental in the, the implementation of all of that. Uh, a lot of the coaches have taken a new sense of leadership in the ACE block, uh, which has been fantastic for us. And for this year, as we're shifting around aspects of the mentoring program, a lot of the coaches have really taken um, ownership over working with first and second year teachers and ensuring they have a lot of good support. A lot of the kind of formal observations that I've done this year have been one-on-one -on -one coaching meetings, the almost these coaching cycles with new teachers, and I've been really impressed with the quality of the work. Um, to dovetail that, to help out with these ACE blocks, uh, our commitment kind of getting back to the, the data collection, the data bank, expanding what we're thinking about in terms of data, looking at student work, uh, thinking about different types of protocols, using more observations. Um, in some cases, we've been doing a little videotaping and then sitting down and uh, talking through some of those lessons and then what we've implemented this year more widespread has been um, some assessments, almost screeners, that are for K through two. And that's been helpful in our ACE blocks and also in thinking about how we might support some of those students in tier two and tier three, which brings us to the next slide. Thank you. So for here, um, over the past couple of years, this kind of connects to some funding sources. Um, we've been shifting the... Um, uh, the profile of our math intervention is for the elementary level. We've been moving away from a paraprofessional model for each school towards a fully licensed teacher that has experience. We have some reasons for doing this. Um, we want to shift towards something that in, uh, embraces both push in and pull out. We don't want all of our services always to be, pull, be pulled out. So we're really trying to ensure that the interventionists that we're working with, they have experience in the classroom they can go in there and they can support the teacher. They can co-teach. They could um, uh, work with small little groups inside of the, the classes. It's working out well for us. Um, in some instances, even in the support that we're doing, what we're uh, 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 framing it as is pre-teaching. And again, for some of our folks that are newly hired interventionists, they have that teaching background in terms of whole classes. So it's giving us a lot more uh, flexibility. Um, Right now, we do have two power professional uh, staff at Pierce and at Stratton, and one of the requests is to ship them. Uh, next slide, please. Gibbs. Um, I think I say this every single year. When I was looking back at all the prior uh, 
presentations. Every year we're shifting around what we're doing for computer science and we're still shifting. We've been around that 38 to 45% of students at Gibbs, I'm sorry, at, L at OMS, who are opting for our elective. Gibbs is still mandatory. We're probably around 98% just in terms of service delivery, things like that. Uh, but it's been fantastic. Um, the work that we've been able to accomplish this year has been a great shift. Uh, for our six through eight math teachers, uh, this is year two of our implementation of uh, a curriculum that is supported by Desmos. It is a variation of illustrative mathematics curriculum uh, with much more dynamic features uh, within Desmos. Um, we've had a lot of success with that. One of the uh, aspects of the work for our seventh and eighth grade teachers in particular has been thinking about how we can bring more collaborative aspects to uh, this tech forward platform. Uh, in our math intervention program, this is going to come up in a little bit as well. We've been playing around different ways in which we can uh, support students who are struggling. We're pushing in much more with our EL classes. The concept of pre-teaching that I discussed a minute ago in the elementary, that was actually born out of our middle school work from a couple of years ago. We still have that um, happening. Um, and across the board, this has been a message for the past few years. How do we improve representation in our courses? Um, and what we're seeing is some pretty good dividends with uh, where students are in all of our courses, which has been great. Uh, next slide, please. Mr. Colton, I just wanna sort of give you a time check. You, you're about halfway through the, the time. Francis. Okay. Yep, I'll be good. Um, <laughs> thank you. So high school, we have a SEI math course that's um, now brought in. Over the past few years, we've seen an increase of students who have limited or interrupted uh, formal education. So we've had to restructure. Uh, that work is great. I alluded to a little while ago, the idea of building thinking classrooms. This idea is originating somewhat out of the middle school and high school as well. We have a lot of our teachers who are reframing, restructuring what's happening in their class with this idea um, and more revisions in the uh, CS. Uh, this year, we offered a cybersecurity class through SUPA, Syracuse University Project Advance, which allows students to earn uh, college credit. And then right now, we're actually piloting, trying out. We wanted a course that was a little bit more open, something that was, um, I don't want to say student-driven, but almost that. It's called Community Projects in CS. So one of our CS teachers is running it, and it, it's, it's been going great. They're doing some neat stuff in there. Uh, next slide. All right, next year, elementary, we really wanna continue with the work we're doing. We wanna complete the elementary intervention team. So some of the budget asks are shifting over the uh, paraprofessional uh, staff folks, moving the professional. Um, and then another area, and this is connected to the idea of the I ILT and building-based uh, supports. We are really interested. We are looking forward from the math department point of view, ways in which we can collaborate with our coaches, our interventionists, support staffs, this is something that is important to me. I, I love teams. I love folks that collaborate and work across multiple disciplines and think about how we solve problems together. So that's gonna be something we'll be pushing for as well. At Gibbs, um, we have some shifts. All four of these items go together. We have some things that we're looking forward to over the next couple of years. An area that I think is, is pretty important for us and this kind of connects to this idea of shifting around math support we haven't changed a lot of our structures in grades six through eight in the past few years. And we're probably at the point right now where we have to start to think, how do we shift some of those structures to improve that representation and improve our supports for all students? So in the budget asks in terms of shifting things around, we're looking for a six through eight math coach. Uh, we've been working with the teachers and they're, they're on board. Like it's, it's something that they're looking for. We do want to keep shifting around what we're doing with uh, our math support uh, program, thinking about um, how do we actually support some of our more struggling learners, but how do we create more environments where this idea of allowing more access to rigorous courses is there. So this is going to be dovetailed. And I know, I think it may have been November 15th when Mr. Merringer had presented all, all of you, we had a goal on OMS's books that for the 24-25, what we're interested in is, is how would we pilot? How do we think about potentially creating a heterogeneous class that's based on what we have right now? So what we're doing in terms of thinking ahead is putting in a math coach, thinking about differentiation, thinking about adding some rigor for all students, shifting around that math support, 
can we use some of that work next year to help us be uh, create that springboard for 24, 25, where we can restructure that math, uh, that seventh grade experience. We don't have any plans right now for eighth grade, and in all honesty, it'll probably stay as math eight and algebra one, but we are interested in those structural changes. Uh, the other part of it as well, and this kind of goes with the whole entire middle school experience, the bypassing program has been around now for nine years. Um, and I think next year, it's the appropriate time for us to sit down, reflect, and think about across the board for the district, is that the best mechanism? Is that the best lever? Is this actually a program that we'd want to persist? So for me, when I'm thinking about next year, that differentiation, the meeting needs of all students, increasing a little bit of rigor, and thinking about and talking about some structural changes is where we'd want to be for, for the middle school. Uh, next slide, please. Um, same type of thing for the high school in terms of some of the changes. The push that's going to be more at the high school is going to be interdisciplinary or cross-department uh, uh, work. So we've been in good discussions with uh, the new art director, Leo. He's awesome. Uh, we're thinking about uh, creating a shared staff. There are some computer science classes that in all honesty could be art classes. So we're trying to think about how we would partner together as a computer science and art department. We'd want to know how does that look with, with science? How does that look with um, even civics? A lot of these crossovers are there. Um, another thing that we're really looking to do for next year, I put a question mark for this one, but uh, for a long time, we had the math fair project. This was something that was a great integral part of what we were doing for our freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Uh, we haven't done it since 2020 uh, due to the pandemic. We've prioritized other work. So I think that's going to be something that we're going to look to bring back for next year as well. Uh, next slide. All right. This is going to be super fast. Um, actually, you can go on to the next slide as well. One more. Okay, thank you. We partnered with uh, MIT last year and also this year. This idea of representation and access and opportunity is very important to us. Um, we, we don't do a well, great enough job of that in the math and computer science realm. I'm focusing on CS because that's a little bit worse off for us than the math part right now. And there's also another reason. There's a good chance there's gonna be legislator put out there where a computer science class is going to be mandatory for graduation, maybe in three or four years. This is something that for me, you know, as the director, I'm trying to un understand and make sure that computer science is much more integral to part of the overall district um, and the, the, the experience of the students. So participating in this PACE project uh, has been awesome. It's given us a professional learning community with other districts facilitated by a researcher at MIT, where what we're doing is looking at issues of access and opportunity and representation, and how do you build capacity for your staff? Um, the other part of it that I think is wonderful is the crossover with our counselors department. In order to be part of this grant, we needed some guidance counselors to be part of it. Last year was Karen Boschler. This year we have Karen Boschler and Matt Ruiz. That connection has been fantastic for us in terms of building understanding for those folks who actually work with those students on the ground floor. Um, and it also allows us to just advertise and, and just better get that message out there, uh, which has been fantastic. Next slide, please. Uh, because of this work also, we've done a lot of, of outreach. Uh, these have been some of our goals and action items that we created as part of this project. So a big thing that we did for this year is actually reaching out to some of those uh, affinity groups and other groups that could give us good feedback and good advice. So we've been surveying our own students. Um, Clayton Jones, one of the teachers I really want to give kudos to, he's been meeting with different affinity groups. He's been really trying to, to work with students and listen to what they're interested in. Um, I have some of the takeaways in a minute, uh, but it's one of those things where uh, that outreach, that understanding for us is invaluable to, to move forward, uh, which is great. Um, next, next slide. All right. This I'm going to go real fast. This right here is a really good estimate. If I were to think about race, ethnicity, I'm doing a little hand waving with some of this. This is a pretty good estimate of uh, percentages for our students. Uh, been true for the past couple of years, roughly. Uh, next slide. This was last year. We had 154 students in computer science. You could see at the bottom, the distribution was okay. Uh, not, not great, but I think it was pretty close to what our, our overall representation is. The next slide shows something. Keep the 154 in mind. This is this year with 212 students. 
this is on our minds because our department, this computer science department is growing fast, very, very fast. I don't know if all of you remember, but in 2013, 2014, we had zero students. It has basically been growing quicker than I can keep up with. Even the budget asks for this year pertain to computer science. So right now we're seeing an increase. It's great. Even for the percentages of different racial and ethnicity is improving. But let's go to the next slide. What's one more, please. What is worsening for us is that uh, when we look at this at a gender point of view, uh, right now it still is a male dominated field. We were improving prior to the pandemic and we have been worsening since. And this is in spite of the fact that for our AP math classes, there's a higher percentage of young women in them than men. So we have this field, we have this, these sets of courses that right now, racial ethnicity, we're doing an okay job. We have a lot of work, but our outreach for young women is, is pretty much a need. And this is kind of uh, puzzling to us. Our theory of action was in building those middle school classes which actually are representative. We had hoped that it would have yielded better results for the high school and so far it hasn't. Um, all right. I think that's probably about okay. The what we're left we do, I think we can skip through. I just wanna make sure I'm giving everyone a chance to, um, to ask some questions. Um, so what do, we, what do we have? Thank you. No problem. Questions or comments from the committee? And sorry, I was trying to throw a lot at you in 12 minutes. So I really appreciate it. Thank, no, I, we, thank you. I appreciate that. Sorry. And we had the slides I, and we're able to look at them ahead of time. So good. I'll, I did ask Dr. Homan for 24 minutes. I thought a math and CS <laughs> thing might warrant like two, but and I, you know, and that, I, wasn't, that wasn't going to fly. And I <laughs> asked for it to be a little shorter because I want us to have a chance to have a conversation. So Ms. Yeah, Morgan. and that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Great. So um, thank you for all of this. I think it's helpful. Um, the the I, I've been always the one who asks about the gender distribution at Audison. Yeah. Um, so I'm super yeah. excited that it's just right here. I mean, this I know this is at, at, at AHS. I'm really excited that it's here in the slide and, and that we can talk about it. I guess I'm curious what you know, what kind of outreach are you doing? Are there, um, for students who identify as being female, they're clearly underrepresented, like with a capital U comparatively, yeah. right? And so and I'm curious, like how, how, like how, how do you, how do you do that? And I think that, you know, the difference is, I think it's important, right? Is that the Audison, to, when you elect to take computer science, for most students, they're not opting out of something else <coughs> generally yep. because of how the schedule works, right? But in order to take computer science at, at AHS, you're, you're, it's, you're picking it as your elective, right? And so you're, you're choosing to not take any of this other like range of great choices too, right? So they are yep. structured a little differently. So do you, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the complicated answer and then try not to get it too much into the weeds. You're exactly right about the electives. Uh, uh, one of the obstacles has been when you go into ninth grade, there's one spot for an elective. Structurally, a lot of those electives have always been year long. A few years ago, um, we had tried to create a half year elective for CS. It didn't work because there's nothing else to complement it with at the freshman level. So I am psyched. I am so happy that Leo is now kind of broached into this idea for the art department of half year electives, because in reality, if that's going to work next year, what we're looking to do, I, I even, I have a meeting with a few teachers about this on, on Friday of next week, but how might we be able to structure some of our CES classes to be intro classes half year for that freshman year? Because in reality, if we might start to soften up some of those, um, those, those other parameters, if we can maybe get some more young women in freshman year for a half year, maybe that helps. The other thing, and this was kind of an interesting one. This was one of the takeaways from the survey. Um, Clayton had gone and met with those affinity groups. A lot of students who weren't enrolling in the CS classes were scared by the names of the classes. So even one of the bigger takeaways that we had was, can we just make some of them sound a little more friendly or make it so that they're a little bit more appealing? I don't know if that's gonna be a cure-all, but that's such a simple solution that we've already started to talk about changing some of the names just to make it a little bit more appealing. Uh, but yeah, so right now, not for next year, but the following year, can we semesterize some of those freshman classes to get young women inside of them? And then the other one is um, maybe shifting some of the names around. And 
the continued outreach is going to be part of it as well. You know, it's 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 such a simple move by us, something that we should have done more of in the past, quite honestly. And now that we are getting a little bit of a rhythm and we've created some surveys, I think that will be a little bit better for us to get some feedback. Great. Yeah. And I hope that, you know, to the extent, I mean, I think part of it too, is somebody who has like, is, is to the, if, if there are opportunities to offer courses to students who identify as female, where they're not in a 75, 23 split somehow, you know, like it would yeah. be really nice to be in a class that's closer to 50, 50. And it, it might, if, if you can create some of those um, to give opportunities to students to not be so in the minority, they may talk yep. to their friends and there may be more interest. So thank you. I really, I, I, I know that this is something that you and I have talked about for years and you've yep. always been so candid and, and open to talking about it and thinking about it. And I've just, I've always really been grateful for that. So mm -hmm. thank you. Mr. Thank you. Matt, this gender disparity, is it reflected in, in the, college level and uh, the real world. It was 50 years ago when my wife started. There were no computer classes at the high school level. S people that decided to go into computers were either math majors or music majors, uh, the logic people. Um, is there a relationship on the gender? Do you yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, this, our numbers pretty much match the national average, which is that three to one, that three to one field. And unfortunately, fortunately, I don't know how you'd want to frame it. We're no different, and that bothers me because I think we should be different. Uh, I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, I, you I, know, agree, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, that disparity, I, I can't speak to the interim, but for 50 years, my wife, who was a, is still, she kept up with it. She's current in uh, software and th writing software and stuff like that, but there still is that bias. I don't know where it exists. Yeah, in, in all transparency though, that is something that I would see, like that feeling of, I was just described a little while ago, maybe cohorting some of the young women together to feel like they're not so separate. That's one of the, the bigger issues we have overall with a lot of our marginalized students though. Mm -hmm. You know, even for some of our students who identify as black, they, they may not go into an AP math class because they prefer to go into a class with their friends. And that part of it has been true for us for a while. And that's why that, that sense of a belonging, that, that idea, when I talked to the teachers this year about course selections, I tried to change the words I was using intentionally and I told them this. We're not just informing our students about the classes they're taking. We wanna make sure we're actively inviting them and making sure that they understand that these classes are their classes. Because we're not, overall, our culture, our, our school, we haven't done a good enough job with that just yet. So it's one of those things when we're thinking about these classes and students are taking classes because they want to be with other students they feel more comfortable with. Um, that to me is like this weird cultural roadblock that you probably have to talk about and work through. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Mr. Carden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Coleman. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, the strategic in initiative around MTSS, particularly at the middle school, yeah. at the at the autism level, because, as you mentioned, um, you know, math support there is, um, you know, it's 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 struggled a little bit. You did you did update a few year, a couple of years ago to make it pre-teaching. I'm not sure that that has it wasn't successful for my daughter, but it, I'm not sure in general <laughs> that that was. Um, I, I don't know what we're, how we're looking at to measure whether that change was successful or not. But I I I, I do. I'd love to see more, um, a more rigorous approach to looking at how we support um, our struggling math learners at the middle school level where they really fall out. Um, and that is connected to the seventh grade class because we don't wanna make it worse. So I look forward to seeing that conversation next year. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Mr. Coleman. It was great. Um, I appreciate hearing the information about the gender disparity in computer science. So I'm not going to ask about that, but I like hearing about it. Uh, but I was wondering, what is pre-teaching? Um, yeah. When you're good. good question. So, you know, for the middle school, the way it looks, I should say this: this was born out of some work we did with the Education Development Center in Waltham. So when we were working with them, probably about four or five years ago, this is just before the pandemic, 
it was this idea of creating a secondary curriculum map. So if you have your core essential standards, your narrative that you've gone throughout the year, you're creating that secondary map that actually echoes a lot of the core essential standards. So a lot of the times interventions are reactive. You know, you might see a student who is struggling with X and then you pull them out of something and you try to fix X and then you send them along the way. But math is kind of weird in the sense that let's say a student's in eighth grade and they're doing, and they're working on linear equations. That linear equations, if they're struggling, you may not want to intervene right away because maybe when they get to solving linear equations, systems of linear equations later, that prerequisite skill might be needed. So the math intervention program is going to, instead of being reactive to what they were struggling with, being thoughtful about where there's opportunities to learn. And when you're about to go into your next unit, you're sitting there and giving a double dose of maybe those skills to make it so that students can access the class, the, the content in tier one. So in theory, and we, you know, I, I am sorry that maybe it's, it's not working in all cases, but in theory for a lot of students, it gives them a different sense of confidence. This idea of belonging and voice and agency, to me, it feels a lot better if I could put a student in a position of going into their core class and being able to answer a question because they feel confident. But if they've already worked on maybe some of those ideas two to three weeks beforehand, and they've been building up that, that skill set, they're engaged differently. They're not, they're not separate because they're, they're struggling. So the pre-teaching is a little bit, it's, it's flipping that model a little bit of how we think about intervention, quote unquote. It's one of the reasons why we kept math support as a full year. So that way, you know, if we have these students that, you know, sometimes there are other issues than just the math ability. There might be confidence issues or, or something else. We want to be able to kind of always be forward thinking and putting some of those students in a position to do that. Now, full disclosure, the pandemic muddied everything. So this is something that we're finally getting back to. You know, we're doing a little bit better job for this year. But to me, that model feels better. It feels like it's, it's not reactive and it's not thinking about what their deficits are. It's thinking about how it can build from those opportunities to learn to keep them in a class. Thank you. Mr. Zaman. Uh, Matt, thanks very much for the presentation. It's always well thought out. We appreciate that. My question is Thank the, you. you talked about the 200 and uh, some odd students in computer science classes. What, what is that, like what is that doing for our space, con space const is that causing space <laughs> constraints and could you speak to that? Yeah, no, we're, we're okay. You know, so computer science, luckily enough, has shifted over the past few years where, you know, desktops, some of these other parameters that may have been an issue three, four years ago, they're not there anymore. Okay. We could order MacBooks for everything. So we have our STEM lab at the high school, which is beautiful. And I should say, just to give it its due, that space attracts kids. You know, just opening up the new STEM wing has increased our enrollment. I, I, I know I always say this, but there's 1,531 students-ish in the high school right now, and we have 1,774 students enrolled in a math or computer science class. Like, kids want to be. We're at 116% enrollment. Kids want to be in that wing. They want to be in these classes. So what we're doing actually is for our other CS teachers, uh, they just have the classrooms that are uh, adjoining that are right next to the STEM lab. So that way, if there are resources in the STEM lab, folks can go back and forth. Uh, there's just a little bit more of a community that's being built. So we're not lacking for space. Um, the first five weeks of next year, there might be a little bit of a challenge, but we'll, we'll work through that. We, well, we set it up so you can, but hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll be good. We'll figure it good. out. Okay, good. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to something that we've remarked on earlier in the year. When I saw the MCAS scores for math in this district, the lowest growth score was 55 in the, in the, in the fourth grade. The rest of the growth scores by grade level were 60, 60, 64, 71, in seventh grade, which is just off the charts, 63 and 62. Uh, because this is a uh, mean of the means, uh, those numbers are much more dramatically high than you'd think of just by taking a look at the normal distribution of, of, uh, of scores. You're, you're talking about the middle score and the distribution for us compared to the middle school for the state. And the, th this is just simply spectacular and I think that particularly 
as we're going through the middle schools, this shows a lot of effort and a lot of movement in this district, and that the quality of instruction and support tier one has been really good coming out of the pandemic. And I just wanted to put that on the table and commend yep. all the math teachers out there and the support people and the coaches for what we're doing that, that has allowed students to grow. I appreciate that. I am lucky to work with so many phenomenal professional educators. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the one thing I will say is, and I think I always allude to this and say this each year, I know we're not perfect, mm -hmm. but I can confidently say that for myself and the folks that I work with, we're always looking to improve. Mm -hmm. Like we are analytic driven. We're always, we are always trying to think about ways in which we could do things differently. And your support, the school committee support, the budgetary support has allowed us to grow and change. So from, from my point of view, thank you as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make a comment. Um, you may or may not know that I teach in, a, in another district and um, yep. we started the same curriculum in elementary school that you have been using. And so I've been going to a lot of professional development and the videos that they show us are of um, Stratton classrooms. Mm -hmm. So it just yep. shows <laughs> how, yeah. um, how engaged and how much professional development um, the staff here in Arlington are receiving and that it is being shared across the state with other districts. So I appreciate the work that you have, have done to support yeah. that as well. Turk, Turk being right down the road is a great partnership. <laughs> I'll just quickly say that I very much enjoy working with Mr. Coleman and all of his team that I will echo the results from last year speak for themselves um, and really show how excellent some of the adjustments in curriculum and programming that we've made throughout the pandemic have been, but also that I, you know, the coaching model that Mr. Coleman has set up at the elementary school level is also a model for the district and for other districts. And so thank you so much for all of the work that you've been doing. It's really exciting to see computer science expanding so much at the high school. And I know that we'll get a handle on making sure that our young women are just as engaged with all of that programming as we can. Um, so well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Have a great night and thank you for the flexibility for being remote. I and my kids appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Take care. All right. Um, next we have the AHS heterogeneous grouping initiative update. Dr. Janger. So thank you all for uh, having me. Um, we have Deb Perry, the uh, um, English language arts curriculum leader lurking somewhere in the back on Zoom and um, as well as Nicole Edson who's been serving as the uh, lead teacher in court helping coordinate the uh, common planning times and professional development work with the heterogeneous group. Um, I actually, somebody's calling me. I um, just came from, uh, I just had to give a shout out, I just came from um, the Massachusetts Music Educators Association conference where our Madrigal Choir was performing. They were selected as one of three ensembles to perform um, in a blind audition for the entire group. And um, I was one of the first people on my feet for the standing ovation they got. It was really an amazing, an amazing presentation. And it was fun because all the other music educators from Arlington were behind me you know, tapping along and getting all excited about every one of the performers. And then the next group was an eighth grade rock band that all of us old people were all jumping up and down for. But it was really an amazing presentation. So a big shout out to our magical cho uh, chorale and chorus, as well as uh, Mara Walker, their um, presenter. All right, so I probably don't have, I've used up half of my time. Um, so I will jump to this. Um, <clears throat> So I think this is the fourth or fifth presentation I've made to the school committee in one kind or another this year. So I'm, I tried to keep this presentation short to really just be focusing on current information and then talking a little bit more about where we're gonna go next. Um, and some of these statements will come a little bit as a question because I think some guidance from the school committee since you've taken such an interest on the process um, and the direction this goes about some of the timing of how we're gonna wanna look at this in the future. Um, so if you go to the first slide, I'm going to talk 
um, briefly about participation um, because there have been changes in the middle of the year, primarily about uh, great outcomes for semester one, um, and then a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the spring, that next part. And then we have um, uh, Ms. Perry and Ms. Edson here to talk a little bit about the teacher's experience and feedback on that. So jumping first to participation. So at the middle of the year, if you'll remember, as part of the heterogeneous grouping, we were allowing students to make a decision to change levels. Um, and we were very pleased um, that the pattern seemed to go sort of where we would hope it would go um, and in a way that we would hope it would go, which is the 12 students switched into honors and uh, four students switched into A. And so the students had conversations with their teachers, made a thoughtful change, and I think made a change that overall um, is better for them. So that was a net at, of eight students moving up, which increases the number of students by a little over 2% um, taking honors. So if you look at the table, um, we go from rounding off 66% to 68%, um, but about a 2% increase in the number of students. I did not break that down again by race and ethnicity since the numbers were so small. I didn't want to call out particular students. When we wrap this all up at the end, the, next, the last presentation we'll do, we'll just look at the overall participation for the whole year. Um, and so that's just a picture of the same thing. Um, just pointing out, Dr. Homan had asked me to switch around the order, so if you get confused mm -hmm. looking, if you toggle between this and the last presentation, they go in opposite directions now. Um, but so that is the two comparison years, 2020 and 2022. And then that's the first quarter and then the full semester and then the second semester participation rate going up over the year. So then switching down to the next. This is a quick breakdown of grades overall. Um, and I focus primarily on grades overall here in the slides. You can see a little more detail on the charts. Um, in part because the grades by level are a little confusing because we've moved uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 18% of the class um, into a different level. So if you look at grades overall, what you see is, again, consistent with what we found in the first quarter, um, that grades overall have increased slightly um, or remain the same. Um, grades by level, interestingly, have a little bit less clear of a pattern because they actually, at both levels, have gone down a tiny bit. And the reason at both levels they've gone down a tiny bit, but that the overall goes up, is because what you're doing is taking out of curriculum A a lot of students who would have been getting A's and B's. You're moving them into the honors level where they may slightly pull down the average, but their grades did not go down. Um, their grades are the same because otherwise the overall average wouldn't go up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I managed to confuse myself at one point in the doing of those slides. Um, and the really good news is that you see that same pattern um, across every demographic group. Um, and in particular, the African American students has a real positive impact because there's a significant increase, as we remember from the first quarter, in participation rates. And the grades that students are getting in honors are actually significantly higher. And then if you go to by gender, again, you see the same pattern um, that the grades overall are the same or higher in spite of the fact that 18% more students are doing um, honors work. Um, so then where do we go with that? So that's sort of our performance data. And grades are great. They are a main measure of student learning. And, um, effective participation, but grades are also problematic. Um, the question then we have to have is looking under the hood, does this represent higher level discourse? Does this represent deeper learning? Does this represent engagement and belonging on the parts of the students? And so going forward in the spring, we'll be doing the classroom panorama survey. Our plan is to do the panorama survey in grades 9 and 10 um, because we want to be able to have comparison data. Next year, these students who were in ninth grade heterogeneous are going to go to 10th grade, so it would be nice to see whether their difference, their experience is different from this year's 10th grade. Um, and in addition, if we make changes in the year after next, um, we would like to be able to compare to a two-year 
to see whether the climate, the culture, the rigorous experience um, has changed in those classes. Um, we plan to do a parent survey um, to get similar information. We'll model that on the panorama questions. So we're asking comparable information. Um, and then we'll be looking at end of year grades, which we won't have till June. So my next presentation to the school committee should have, oh, you yeah, should have, in, oh, you're jumping ahead. Sorry. Should have information on the first two bullet points, will not have information on the, the third bullet point. And then we're gonna look as well, the teachers have been collecting through their common planning information on what they're seeing in the common assessments, what they're seeing in terms of discourse in class. And so we'll do a more coherent summary of that for you at our next presentation. And now, I will hand the microphone over to uh, Ms. Itzen and Ms. Itzen and uh, Ms. Perry. You guys are oh, muted. Ms. Do you want me to start or? I think you're muted. <clears throat> yes, you start. Okay, so um, hi everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I just have a couple of notes, a couple things to speak on in terms of the common planning time, what we are planning to do here for the March retreat, um, and then moving forward into the summer. So um, in our common planning time, currently the way that it's um, that it's working right now, I mean, most of semester one common planning time was used to do debrief how the pilot was going um, and to make sure that we were aligning our differentiation practices between the, um, between the levels and how our assignments were looking. Um, reporting to make sure that we were differentiating and that we were meeting the needs of all students and how we were doing that in our individual classes. Um, the common planning time is split, meaning there are four teachers, just because of the way that the schedule is, there are four teachers who meet um, during one block and there are four teachers that meet during another block. Um, so we tend to use the PLC. Obviously, we have our common planning time, but then when we all come together in our PLC, that's when we'll talk and kind of compare notes and things that we've been doing in common planning time. We do have a, um, a common collaborative um, Google Doc where we keep notes for each common planning period. Like there's a D block group and then the E block group. So we can each look at each other's notes and then use the PLT, PLC time to share out um, what we've been working on in the common planning time and then work from there about what our goals are in the PLC and what we need to be working on each time. In terms of the March retreat, uh, which we're doing next week, actually, March 8th. We, the first thing are some of our objectives. The first objective is to um, think about the adjustments for next year based on the pilot structure for year two, uh, what we need to change or what's going to stay the same. Uh, we are also going to be working on grade calibration, specifically with writing. So essentially, we'll be looking at student samples and um, grade norming, as well as thinking about what we're seeing um, about the quality of student work and the consistency across each class. Um, from there, uh, what generally tends to happen out of those conversations, um, a lot of times we'll start reevaluating or reexamining the scope and sequence of our writing skills and really thinking about what happens when in the year and why we choose to do it that way and make sure that it's working and make sure that it's working. I mean, this is something we've done in the past, but really making sure that it's working um, in this structure um, as well with the heterogeneous grouping. And then we'll be aligning our skills throughout the year for the school year 2023-2024 um, and beyond. And then also from there planning what we need to do in the summer. So kind of once we've had that six hour day next week, we'll be able to see what we really need to work on over the summer and what we need to get through. Um, I think the only thing that I will add to what Nicole said is that there's a lot of interest in meeting next week to talk about writing and talk about norming our writing a little bit more. Um, it's a it's probably the biggest topic of of interest on the part of the teachers. Um, everyone is everyone I've talked to is very enthusiastic about the heterogeneous grouping from the teacher's perspective. Um, and I think um, having a chance to have a full day next week to work through some some questions that we have and then be able to sort of practice what we have come up with for the remaining um, weeks of the school year will really be a, a great opportunity. And then we'll be able to take a couple of days in the summer to um, to continue whatever work it is that we feel we need to do. So we feel like we're in pretty good shape. Um, if you have any questions, I think you can ask us now. So 
I was going to wrap up one thing before we jump oh, to sorry. questions. Um, so one of the questions that we're going to have for this conversation or that I will hope we'll get feedback through you from, to, to Dr. Homan um, is just timing and some of the process. So if you think about you know, this is a two-year pilot and but decisions about structural changes for 24-25 need to be something that we are of some idea of by December or January of next year if anything represents structural changes in the um, student handbook. Not the student handbook, I'm sorry, the program of studies. Um, so my thinking was that we would present about the belonging engagement in learning information at the next meeting um, and that we would gather up the final data at the summer, in the summer in June. <coughs> the teachers would reflect about that at the retreat. We would present in that um, in the fall um, and then we would re reconvene in sort of the September to November period another study group to have a conversation about kind of what are the implications, what have we learned, what are the implications both in English and in other departments, what have we learned from this, and what, if any, impacts are there. So I think that it's going to be helpful for us to get some sense, right, because this, we've learned many things, right? Um, you know, the one simple thing I think we appear to be learning and seeing is a heterogeneously grouped um, English 9 works well to give kids a rich experience, more flexible access um, to their colleagues, larger levels of inclusion and involvement. If that gets expanded, it could get expanded horizontally in ninth grade. It could get expanded into tenth grade. Um, it could change other classes at other places. There's a lot of ways in which we could take that lesson. It's also taught us other things, and there's conversations going on parallel to that um, around ways in which you support diverse groups of students in classes, ways in which you look at your experience even in leveled classes, then making sure that you're being more equitable about the experience of students in level A classes versus level H classes. So some of the work, for example, that I was just talking with Caitlin Moran about in history, about how they're aligning their curriculum, they're not necessarily talking about, you know, in some of those classes doing heterogeneous grouping right away or anytime soon, but they are really looking at are the students having access to high level discourse in those classes. So I think some of how we guide that conversation so it doesn't get infinitely large would also be really helpful to us. That's me. Thank you. Thank you. Questions or comments from the committee? Mr. Cardiff? Um, so it's a small number of students. I know you can't speak <laughs> in too much detail, but I'm curious about the four students that did switch down. Um, it, is there any consent, is there any sort of trend that it was grades or um, a lack of motivation or is there any, any trends from, from emerging from that? So the guidance that we gave to the students for whether or not they might want to switch was parallel to the guidance we've given folks about level changes for next year. Um, so our recommendation was if you're getting an A or B, you're not struggling with the work um, and you're not having difficulty with attendance, you should probably continue on at the level. If you're getting an A, not struggling with the work and not struggling with attendance, at level A, you should probably do H. So for the most part, those four students were students who were experiencing one of those three issues. They weren't getting an A or B, so they weren't meeting standard, um, or they were struggling a little bit with the workload. Great, thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Do you anticipate any changes, major or minor, for next year? Um, I, 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 we haven't had a lot of the conversation, but I mean, it's a pilot, so the plan is not to do major, right? Mm -hmm. The structure is supposed to stay in place for two years, from, so we learn from it. So a lot of it is going to be adjustments in terms of grouping, mm -hmm. how the teachers work together. Um, you know, most of it has sort of structurally worked pretty well, mm -hmm. so I don't know that we would change much of anything. Yeah, I, I know that as you're going through a pilot, you're going to look at this and say, I wish we would have done A or B, and maybe tweaking the schedule or moving a few things around uh, is, is a possibility. Uh, I'm sure it, it's early in the process. You don't have to make those decisions right. in the beginning of March, but certainly as you're planning out your master schedule for next year, 
uh, that, that's just sort of the question that I have in my back, so back of my mind. So as we build the master schedule, we would love for the common planning time to accommodate all eight teachers. But going into the fall of this year, we're going to be short classrooms for five weeks. Mm -hmm. And so likely that scheduling flexibility is not going to be available to us. Okay. That, that was just sort of my yeah. point of curiosity. I'm, I'm glad to hear the largely positive results of the program. Thank you. Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Janger. I had a couple questions thinking back to when we were talking about piloting last year and the concerns that I heard from parents at that point. And first, I was wondering how parents and I'm asking about parents, especially because we were really hearing more from parents than students, how parents are feeling whether the heterogeneous honors classes is being taught at the same level as the previous homogeneous honors. And I understand you haven't done a survey yet, but is there anything that speaks to, you know, are you hearing complaints or, or um, So anecdote, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, that, that's, that's all I was going to say. So anecdotally, um, I have not had a single complaint about ninth grade English this year. Um, so I think that speaks to that. The parents who are currently in ninth grade English would not be able to compare to previous years if we asked them, but we will ask them sort of about the questions that we will ask the students on the panorama survey and the questions that we'll ask the parents will have to do just with you know, whether or not you're learning a lot, whether or not the teachers are, um, whether or not you're feeling rigorous, whether or not you're engaged. Um, and if you remember from last year, we did pretty well on um, learning a lot, being respected, um, feeling like the teachers were expert, but not as well on students are engaged. Um, so I'm learning a lot. It's good work, but I may not necessarily love doing it. So we're hoping that those things improve or are at least steady. Um, the one conversation I did have with some parents at the parent coffee and a small group of freshman parents come one day and they had concerns about heterogeneous grouping, but not in English nine um, was the conversation that I had with them. Okay. Um, so there would be some parents who would know, right? The parents who have more than one child, yeah. and this is their second child. Um, then the other question that I had was, whether the differentiated work for honors is the students are finding it really meaningful, engaging, and challenging. And I'm going to throw that one to Nicole. Sure. I mean, we haven't had any student complaints or we haven't had any parent complaints to, to echo what Matthew was saying. Um, I know that we did students, uh, teachers did in surveys in their own classroom kind of asking those types of questions you know how are you feeling about the work do you feel like it's meaningful do you feel like it's engaging do you and um we we haven't heard any issues in terms of um students <laughs> either level complaining about it um or saying that it wasn't challenging or too challenging or so um i think we can kind of revisit that another thing we can think about is how students do when they enter into 10th grade you know do we see anything different with how they're um how successful they are when they enter 10th grade from the heterogeneous grouping. Um, and that's a great conversation that we can have with 10th grade teachers next year, ninth and 10th yeah, grade that, to talk about. Yeah, that'll be very interesting. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I have a question, and it may not be to Dr. Jenger, but more to Dr. Holman. Um, one of the things we had talked about when we agreed to the two-year pilot was some work to be done around the messaging from the middle school to students about selecting mm -hmm. um, honors for curriculum A. And anecdotally, it feels like there's still some confusion about what courses, not necessarily in English, I, I think, because they get supported even once they're in that, that class in ninth grade. but. I guess my question is what kind have, of work has been done so far around that messaging mm -hmm. with supporting the middle school? So I will 
to some extent, I would need Brian uh, Maringer here to help answer that. I know you've been in contact with Brian and so can speak to some of the messaging that we've had because we have eliminated the teacher recommendation um, as a component of the process of selecting. And uh, Dr. Jager and Mr. Maringer have tried to align some of the messaging they're giving around how to go about selecting which level. And I know that the elimination of the teacher recommendation is a challenge in some cases um, because you might want the teacher to weigh in and you might want some guidance. And in those cases on a singleton basis, we're more than, I know teachers are more than happy to provide some guidance uh, to the student. Uh, we just don't want that recommendation if a student is feeling like they might want to strive for a more challenge to discourage them from doing so or if a student feels like they have an idea of what they might want to do for that to interrupt um, what their own sense of their ability to have challenge is. So we've introduced changes in response to a lot of the feedback that we got and it's an adjustment because families are used to us doing that in a particular way and hearing certain messaging around this. I don't know if you want to add anything Dr. Jenger. Yeah I mean so the guidance that was given to all the eighth grade parents and to all the eighth grade teachers is the same as I actually just described, right? Which is that if you are currently getting an A, um, or I can't remember exactly, it was a little different for eighth grade, but an A or a B um, in the general ed class, that, and you're not struggling with your workload and you're not having difficulty attending school, that it's perfectly reasonable to plan to go on to honors. And if you are not, right, experiencing either of those, then you would probably want to consider curriculum A in the classes where that's offered. Um, I will say, Mr. McCarthy did the presentation this year to all the classes, so there's a Zoom presentation where he goes through the process with all the students and the teachers are all there for that. Um, Mr. Maringer, I mean, we came up with that together. We work, workshopped the language so eighth graders would understand it and eighth grade teachers would understand it. Um, and then Mr. McCarthy and I did a presentation in the beginning of February to any eighth grade parent who attended. Um, I will say actually, I felt like there were fewer questions and less nervousness. There's always nervousness, right? You're an eighth grade parent, <coughs> kids going into high school, it's the big leagues. You're not really sure what that experience is gonna be like. You don't wanna get it wrong. Um, but it felt like there was actually less, this seemed much more cut and dried than my teacher said I should do it, but really should I do it? We were like, there's these three things. If you're doing them, it's gonna, because part of it is it's not, it's not, there's a fear, right? Of, you know, this is big, it's honors. And it's like, this is honors, it's okay. If you're doing, if you've been doing okay and you're not struggling, you're gonna be fine. Um, and so I think that, um, I think there's still, still nervousness. I think, you know, maybe we should, I mean, we're now halfway through, so it might be too late. Um, but I think maybe doing a little, Screencastify so that everybody had, you know, the voice of me or Mr. McCarthy talking through those things that they could go back to might be really helpful to make sure they were hearing the same thing. Yeah, thank you. I think that that sounds helpful. And I guess I'm thinking in terms of, um, you know, co collecting information for next mm -hmm. next year and making decisions, um, maybe somehow collecting feedback on current eighth graders, next year's ninth graders experience in selecting a course, mm -hmm. which what they chose and how, how that felt for them Out, outside of English. You know, I, I think my understanding is the goal of this pilot is that some people would like this to expand to other content areas. And so thinking about what experience students are having in English where they didn't need to make a choice or they made a choice in a different way then they're making the choice for other content areas and how that experience has been different. Can I speak to that just quickly? I, I, yeah. I had, I have, I have, no, I, I have a good I know like, sample size, right? Yes. I, have, I have two of them. <laughs> um, so I can say that our experience, the, the sort of mechanics of it this year was super clean. There were no weird pop-ups, no, like, no funny business, which just was Just some art classes left out, but other than that, we're good. The what? Just some art classes left out. Okay. They're in All there right. now. But, like, but, but I mean, you know, in terms of, like, things popping up saying you need a recommendation for this class or, and, and we've had, I've had all those experiences when I've been doing it in the past. Um, you do still pick your... Um, and this would be some feedback, was that you do still have to pick between um, English honors or curriculum A, like last week, um, which 
That's still, that is noted in the description that we asked them for that in part so we can make sure when we're doing, this was part of the plan. We want to make sure that when we are doing the, the classes are the class selection, so, we, which did, seems we didn't fine. inadvertently I mean, push There's a little up. bit of sort of pre, like once you make that decision, are you then more committed to that? I mean, you know, like you pick the blue car and then you want, like, I don't know, I've always said that. I, I appreciate why we're doing it, but there's definitely like a commitment piece that happens in like February that I feel like could really change by September. Um, but I think the idea of having, I, I couldn't go to the ninth grade parent, I think it was actually during our school committee meeting. Um, I think having a message that's really clear that, that can be pointed to, because sometimes the messaging from the individual classrooms at Odyssey is, different, <laughs> um, but if there can be a point that's like, well, this is what the high school is saying. This is what was said at the parent night. This is the, this is the message about, you know, how to, to consider this, I think could be really helpful for people and, and um, sort of reassuring. But our experience was that it was, you know, it was fairly straightforward, which was great. So thank you for all the efforts, because I, I know that power school is a tricky, tricky tool, and um, it, was, it was very clean. So. Mr. Thielman. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's always helpful. Mike, it would be helpful. I don't know who this question is directed to, but maybe the committee, maybe Matt, maybe the superintendent. Is, it would be helpful for us to have a criteria by which we're going to evaluate the success of the program to inform dis a decision we'll make about continuing it, or, or, ex or extending it, rather, to more levels in the, curric in the curriculum. So I don't really, because what I'm not clear on is, <clears throat> like, what's the standard by which we're going to make a decision? I think <clears throat> before we try to answer that, we did set out parameters of what we thought success would be and what some of those metrics would be, which some of which are some yep. of the things that we're already presenting on, yep. uh, tied to participation, tied to representative participation um, in honors level classes uh, and access to those. Some of the, the parameters are things we haven't measured yet. Like we haven't done the survey at the, the spring survey yet. Um, that's another metric we had said would measure the success. Uh, we, to the point that Dr. Jenger made a minute ago, won't have some of the academic indicators back until after we have to make a decision about what, whether, and how to do any expansion on this pilot. Um, but those data are also very important. The uh, percentage of students who pass exceed expectations on the MCAS in grade 10 who were part of this program um, is gonna be a major metric for consideration as we move forward, even if we're not gonna have it before we need to make some determinations about how to move forward next year. So those are things that I know are part of it. I think one of the things we should probably revisit after we do this next round of data collection and reporting out is take a look at some of those metrics in early next year say here are some of the changes we are considering or might want to put in front of the committee ahead of us doing budget conversations here are the support mechanisms or resources that have to be in place the common planning time has been a game changer i know i've heard from the english teachers and from miss perry and from dr jenger so if if, if we do any additional work we have resources we're going to have to dedicate and here are the measurements that we're using to say this is, here are the parts of it that are successful, here are the parts of it that might be less so. So I don't want us to nail down any of those besides to say we've named some. Yeah. Um, and if there are additional metrics that people feel are going to be valuable, it'd be nice to hear what those are. And we can come back with more detail on that in a future presentation. Yeah, that's, that's what I think would be sort of a good curriculum committee discussion. I mean, are we, I guess the, so we would be would we be voting on an expansion prior to approving the budget next year? So this would be sort of like a December January vote. I think any expansion impacts the budget because of the right. resources required. Right. So, so that, I mean, you brought that up when you were talking about so considerations we need to make. When I mean this, to be perfectly honest, hasn't been particularly costly, right? Mm -hmm. It was about apportioning resources that we have, right? Mm -hmm. So scheduling means we preference that, it pushes other things. Mm -hmm. um, so it hasn't been particularly costly. The costs were things like capping class sizes, right? Um, but the class sizes that we capped them at were in the, cap si the class sizes we generally aim for. So 
I don't think that most of our issue will be much in the way of cost because we absorbed it as we always do professional development. We just did it around this. Um, but it will be, you will be having to vote on it when you vote in the program of studies, which will be December, January. Um, you know, so we usually bring it to you in January, but we start planning it in December. So um, we need to know we're sort of moving in a direction if we're going to put something into the program of studies. Yeah, that's a good timeline to be aware of because if we're going to vote at the program of studies in December, it means... You vote it in January, but I write it in December. I'm sorry, we vote it in January. <laughs> it means that changes to the curriculum should be discussed by the committee probably starting in August. You know, August in the or August September in the subcommittees. So I think there needs. I, I'm just saying that it would be very helpful to the committee. I think, just speaking as one member, if <clears throat> there was a plan put in place for when we're going to receive information, when we're expected to make a decision, so there's a timeline for our decision making process because it includes the curriculum committee going through the, the information, the full board, the full committee voting on it, that sort of thing. So I don't know, I just want to be aware of the time. I will also point out that we made a decision to do this pilot in April post budget considerations, yeah. but had in mind that this was a conversation that was ongoing when we built that budget so that it could absorb any associated professional development costs or cost to stipend teachers for the summertime or, and, and so that the schedule and staffing allocated for the high school could absorb the lower class sizes and the common planning time. So the, the structural adjustments are resources. I mean, human and time resources are important too in time. And doing that common planning time with multiple disciplinary areas puts more of a strain on a schedule. So we'd have to think about what the model for that looks like. Yeah. Um, and whether we wanted to do any other structural adjustments to make the embedding of that common planning time easier and less costly if we were to do it in another disciplinary area in addition. So that's modeling we'd want to do when we do the budget, but it doesn't necessarily mean you'd have to make a decision about whether to expand in that model ahead of the budget. It just means we have to make sure the resources are available. All right. Well, I don't want to – I think it would be good to do backward design from the point of school committee decision to, to – I you know, yeah. whatever, that beginning of that process. That's what I would say. Pick the date when we're going to make a decision and then work with the committee leadership to figure out what needs to happen between point A and point B. And I, but, like, we don't even have a proposal. Like, no, I know, there's but, no proposal at the moment. But, <laughs> I, mean, I, but, I, mean, like, but I, but I mean, I'm concerned that my concern is that we'll get to a point where we just have to make a decision and we haven't had a good process beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. So, yeah. I agree. Um, I, we also that don't was have part to of the question. Uh, we Dr. don't Alice have to. Ambie wants oh, to. We don't have to, right. But it feels like a proposal is coming, so I just want to talk about it. Okay, my turn. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to point out that we don't have, we can make a decision that we are going to expand heterogeneous courses into other subjects or things, but we don't have to implement it the next year. We may decide, I mean, because of all these things that are being discussed, we may choose to have a year of setting the stage for implementation. And then, you know, we do two years of the trial, go, okay, it's going well at the end of this. We want to expand it to, I don't know, math, social history, whatever, but not have the expansion happen that next year, have it happen the year after. So. Yeah. Mr. Cardin. Yes, so I mean, I think, I think what you presented about presenting the data as you get it will be helpful, right? And then I think as an administrative team, as the data is coming in, particularly over the summer, that's where you start having those conversations. Are we ready to move? immediately the next year, or as Kirsty said, do we want to pause, collect more data, and wait till the end of the year, and then make that decision and, and implement it, you know, a little bit more slowly. So, but I think what you proposed as far as presenting the data as you get it would be helpful. Dr. Dinger? So, um, this is helpful. That was a question. This is, you're answering the question that I was asked at the end there. Mm -hmm. um, what I, what I think might work, I'm going to phrase this as a statement, but it's a question, um, is 
with our instructional leadership team and the curriculum leader group, the conversations we're having right now in the spring and over the summer have a lot to do with the direction that the departments are looking at going. Um, so I think coming back in either August or September with sort of some rough direction of, you know, if, if the world language, if the uh, modern world history department is saying, you know, over the next three years, this is what we want to do with curriculum and it's not heterogeneous grouping, then that may not be the direction we want to go even if we think it might be a good idea eventually. So I think getting some feedback from those groups about the way, what they see as be their direction, getting some feedback from the English department about what they see as being their direction, and then sort of giving that to you as a rough framework of where we, the conversation we want to have, and then that would allow us to have, I think, because I think we want to have whatever the, the things we're looking at are, you know, because like I said, we could go everywhere, but whatever the things we're potentially looking at are, we then, I think, want to have another round in order to feel comfortable of conversation with the community, right? We don't want to be that, like the English 9 teachers decided, the English teachers decided we should do this in English 10, but we didn't ask anybody, we didn't collect data on sort of the larger community response to that. So that then I think we could, in September, October, November, be having some study on the side. So in November, sort of parallel to budget, where as that all converges, we're giving you an idea of kind of where we would, we're thinking where we want to go, and then we can decide on what kind of the long timeline is. Mr. Slickman. The one thing that worries me is that we're sitting here talking about this like it's a possible deficit as opposed to it's a possible advantage. I want to be in a point where if we're looking in, at this program and saying this is good for kids, kids are doing better, kids who would not have done honors are doing honors and going on to do honors in 10th grade after they've gone through this program. I don't want to slow walk this if this is good for kids. I want to do the right thing for kids. So I would hope that as we walk into September and October and talk about what we're going to be doing for the 24-25 school year, that if the conclusion is that this is good for kids, the question should not be, well, do we keep on doing this? The question should be, okay, now that we've learned this, how else can we take what we learned and apply it elsewhere in the school? Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Janger, for your presentation. Thank you so much. Dr. Holman, I don't know if you want to. We talk and about this all the time. The nice job. <laughs> thank you for being here and hanging in. Thank, well thank you to uh, the English teachers as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Nicole, who's here, and everyone else who's been doing the work. They've been, they, I just want to say they have done a really remarkable job. When you go into those classes, there's really great stuff happening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Next, we have a discussion and possible vote on appraisal of property at zero lot Appleton Street. So, Mr. Thielman, as the chair of the facilities mm -hmm. committee, can you? Yes, I can. Share a little bit about it. <coughs> Mr. Himes on to discuss with us okay. if there oh. are questions or you want him to Oh, is he on? Oh, great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the uh, facilities subcommittee has met um, a couple of times over the past uh, few months and uh, had a number of meetings and we had a discussion about a lot on at zero, located at zero Appleton Street or lo located on Appleton Street and um, this piece of property is owned by the Arlington Public Schools, we believe. Um, <clears throat> it's not being used by the school district at all. Um, and the next step, and the Greek church has an interest in it. And the next step is for an appraisal to take place. And so the school committee has to take a vote to um, authorize an appraisal. And then once we authorize the appraisal, I believe, Doug, this goes to town meeting. Is that, is that correct? Uh, there's an additional step, but yes, that's correct. Okay. And so the motion before the school committee will be moved that the school committee approve and direct the survey and appraisal of a portion of the parcel known as Zero Lot Appleton Street, believed to be owned by the Arlington Public Schools as a portion of the Addison Medical, Middle School campus. And so we, that's what we would be doing. So moved. Second. And so. Oh, so we have a motion by Mr. Cardin, seconded by Mr. Hainer. 
Mr. Thielen, do you want to say more? No, I don't really want to say more. Mr. Hyam is here to answer questions that people okay. have, and I think he's the best horse of it. Yeah. Mr. Suckman. I'm troubled by this. Uh, we've got no documentation. I want to see a map. I want to see what we're voting on. I want to understand what, what, what's going on here. And as I pulled up the GIS map for the, for the, uh, for the area, I can't figure out what's going on. Absent that and a good reason for moving forward, I, I, I want to be convinced before I cast an affirmative vote on this. I mean, the, thing, the other thing that worries me is when we've engaged in school building uh, projects with the state, one of the things that they ask for is the acreage of the property that we own on that parcel. And if we're going to be reducing that by any amount and doing this publicly through a vote at town meeting, I think this can also have an issue with uh, any kind of renovations we might be doing in the future. Mr. Hainer. I guess this goes to Mr. Hyam. Do we definitely know it belongs to the Arlington School? Mr. Chairman, may I? Yes. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, may I? Go ahead, um, Mr. Hyam. Uh, this subject comes up to us because the uh, Greek church did a comprehensive title search on their properties. Mm -hmm. uh, based on that title search, um, while there are what appears to be some potential errors in some deeds, it does appear that there's a high level of confidence <clears throat> that there is a small portion of a parcel. It is very, very unlikely to be the size of a billable lot that is essentially across the street from the Odyssey School. And if you guys have the ability to see on the screen, I do have a map that I could uh, provide for Mr. Schlickman that has some markings that might provide some clarity to the situation. I understand his uh, concerns well. But yes, Mr. Hinner, we, we, we have a fairly high degree of confidence. One of the things that would happen during the appraisal is we would complete our own title search um, and have the property surveyed to get more exact dimensions. Dr. Allison MP. Thanks. Um, so I'm on facilities and I've sat through a couple of the meetings where we discussed this. And just to make it clear, part of the reason we're suggesting going to appraisal, and that's all we, that's all facilities was suggesting, um, was because the map is unclear exactly where the boundaries of the land are. And part of the appraisal will consist of conducting a survey. So we'll actually know what chunk of the land is. The piece that we're talking about is the little wooded area that's at the corner of Acton as it turns down the hill next to Audison mm -hmm. um, that's on the left. And it, uh, at least at facilities, we did not make any sort of decision or recommendation that then we would consider selling it or not. First, we want to just see the appraisal. We want to see what's the land, what's it worth. And we actually asked for whether, as uh, Mr. Hyam goes through figuring this out, whether you know, is the land worth more because it might complete a plot or, or something. And he's going to put that out to the people doing the appraisal. Um, I'm sorry that you folks didn't get maps or whatever in, uh, in Novus, but the maps, as I said, aren't super helpful because they don't actually tell you where, they're, they're ambiguous as to mm -hmm. where the lot lines are. So the appraisal was really the next step. Um, and that's why we brought it forward to the committee. And there was no intent to then go on to town meeting. The first thing was getting the appraisal and then we will make a decision. So. Mr. Hainer. That decision you just mentioned, will that be left to the school committee to go to town meeting with it? Mr. Heim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Hainer, what I would recommend is if the school committee was inclined to have the property appraised and surveyed, is to have it appraised and surveyed, then to come back to the school committee with an idea of its value, which you could keep in confidence, discuss in executive session, 
determine uh, what the conditions of a sale might be, if there are any that you'd like to have. And depending on its value, uh, at that point, you would be deciding whether or not to put it out for an RFP or not. It has to be put out for an RFP if it's worth over $35,000. It does not have to be, but still can be, if it's worth under that amount. Only after the school committee uh, recommended um, disposition of the parcel would it then go on a town uh, warrant would be discussed at town meeting. Thank you. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a pretty straightforward vote. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a process step to get an appraisal right. to give us information so that we can make some decisions. That's all it is. And so I urge us to vote for it and move forward. Okay. So, um, we ha so just to be clear, <clears throat> the motion is to approve and direct for a survey and appraisal of the parcel not to sell it, not right. to <clears throat> get rid of it. To get information. <laughs> to just get more information. Right. Um, okay, so we have a motion by Mr. Garden, seconded by Mr. Hainer. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman? No. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes. That's six in favor and one opposed. All right, um, so I put here just as a placeholder FY proposed budget updates and discussion in case anyone on the committee or Dr. Holman or Mr. Mason wanted to share anything different from what was shared with your presentation. Um, it will be on the agenda at our next meeting to vote to approve the budget. So just this is our opportunity to have a conversation. Um, I'll share quickly a couple of adjustments and then I know we met in budget subcommittee earlier this week so I don't know if Dr. Allison Ampey has anything to add um, or Mr. Mason. We are making a couple slight adjustments to what's listed in ESSER versus what's listed on the general fund moving the director of family uh, communi uh, communications and family engagement onto the general fund and the um, sort of community transition liaison support person onto the ESSER grant. Um, and there are, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more in my update, but the projections are shifting a little bit. We're trying to make sure that we have um, supportive section sizes across the schools and thinking about space also at the schools and where we actually have room to have sections, um, particularly at Thompson, which is tight. So that's impacting a little bit of the enrollment projections as enrollments are coming in, uh, which has an impact, of course, on our uh, needs with regards to the um, reserve positions, but those will all factor into the final document, which we're making revisions to based on some feedback that we got at budget subcommittee. Do you have anything to add? Okay. And I don't know if Dr. Al Stampy wants to add anything. I don't have anything to add. We mainly went through the budget document this past week, um, just trying to clarify questions um, in terms of some of the numbers that had that maybe hadn't been entered correctly by the corresponding holder of that budget but um i don't we didn't i don't have anything else that we needed to add all right thank you superintendent's update dr holman I have a short update, one slide for you this evening. Um, I'd like to remind everyone, and I will be reminding everyone um, soon, that the strategic plan is open for public comment. We have received several comments from community members. We're using that to make adjustments to the documents, which are live. Uh, and that will be open through the end of next week. And then we will be working on creating a final document of st the strategic plan for approval by the committee at the end of this month. We are kicking off hiring season. The pictures you see here are of members of our cabinet team and also our superintendent interns um, at the Harvard Education Expo earlier this month. We've been attending um, various hiring fairs to attract candidates and let them know how awesome Arlington is. And we're looking forward to a really productive and exciting hiring season. Social Worker Week, Appreciation Week, is next week. So we want to say thank you to all of our incredible APS social workers. We'll be celebrating them throughout the week in various ways and encourage families to let their school social workers know how much they are appreciated in, in their support of our students' mental health. It's been a rough few years. They've been providing a lot of services to our students, and we're very <coughs> grateful for everything that they do for our schools and our kids. 
Um, when it comes to administrator hiring, we have a couple of, we're, we're going to have several searches um, because we have a couple of positions that are part of the FY24 budget. We, and we know we anticipate that we might have a few more come up, but we know right now that we have interim director of SEL uh, K-12 to and counseling K-8 to that we're going to need to make a permanent decision around as well as bishop principal. I met with members of the bishop community yesterday, um, all of the teachers and staff at the school during their early release time uh, and attended a bishop PTO meeting that was exceptionally well attended by families there to talk to them about their hopes for the future of the bishop's permanent leadership. Um, and we'll be making some determinations based on feedback I receive from those meetings. I have a little bit more outreach to do to make sure I reach sort of all the corners of that community to get their thoughts. Uh, so I'm looking forward to announcing what the plan is for that very soon. You have enrollment, uh, both the current enrollments as well as a projection sheet in your materials and moving forward from here probably through the summer, I'll be providing you with that projection sheet or rolling it over into next year's reports. Um, the projection sheet is pulling current enrollments and uh, putting them in the next year grade. So it's assuming that all of the students who are in the current grade matriculate forward except for kindergarten. The kindergarten column is showing you the current K um, approved enrollments. So it's the number of students in kindergarten who have gone all the way through the registration process and they're fully enrolled. It's not necessarily everybody who started the registration process and is still working on getting all of their documentation in. We've done the first round of buffer zone assignments, um, and in the first round, everybody received their first choice. Um, and as we move forward, if we have to do small adjustments here and there, we can we can do that. But right now, the sections um, are balanced but small, so there's not really any need um, to not be providing people their first choice. And then we also uh, aligned this year the timing on the opening of um, enrollment for after school care programs uh, to be after the uh, submission of those initial buffer zone decisions so that families would know where they were going to be so that they could sign up and didn't need to double register for after school care. Um, so all of that is going quite well. We're keeping a close eye on um, sections. You'll note that the elementary sections in the projection sheet show us going down two sections from Next year, um, I'm confident we will need those sections. It's just a question of exactly where, and I want to wait for some more data to come in before we make determinations about that. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Great. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 23194 in the amount of $778,462.69, dated February 22nd, 2023. School committee meeting minutes, February 9th, 2023. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Schlickman. Roll call vote, Mr. Hainer. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. And I vote yes, that's unanimous. Subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Allison Ampey. We met, as I mentioned already last week and discussed, or this week, and went over the budget uh, for next year. Thank you. Community relations, Mr. Hainer. Nothing to report. Curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. We scheduled a meeting this week. Um, on uh, March 27th, 27th. Yes, yeah, we did. So. March 27th at 3:45 <laughs> p.m. Um, thank you for all of your adherence to the doodle poll. So the intention of this meeting, oh, we're coming back here before then. Never mind. Okay, carry on. <laughs> Facilities, Mr. Thielman. We met on February 13th. We talked about the property. We just. Uh, are going to do an assessment of, and then we also talk, we also got a report on different progress taking place in the district on uh, improvements in the or addressing issues in the facilities, and by and large, there's good progress in the minutes summarize it all. Michael, is that a good way to describe it? Yeah. <laughs> Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. No report. Uh, high School Building Committee, Mr. Steelman. We meet on Tuesday. Superintendent evaluation, Mr. Cardin. No report. Liaison reports. 
announcements. Um, so I want to make clear to the community and remind the committee that our next meeting on March 16th will be at the METCO headquarters. Um, it will begin at 6.30. Ms. Diggins is working on transportation for anyone who is interested. Mm -hmm. um, and it will not be available on Zoom, but it will be broadcast on ACMI. So community members here in Arlington can watch the meeting. Future agenda items. Will, will we get an email reminder about that? Perhaps the week <laughs> about the meeting? Uh, I, yeah, I'm super excited about it, but I, it, I, 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 yes, Ms. Diggins and I will make sure that Mr. Here. Because I just we, feel like I'm going to be here. <laughs> because we've had Zoom, uh, community members have been able to come and uh, speak to the committee uh, at the beginning of the meeting. We won't have that available. Is there any? Uh, if they want to come to Metco headquarters, they are well. That is an open mm -hmm. public meeting. Fine. The location just happens to be in mm -hmm. Boston. They are welcome to send us an email or come to our March 30th meeting. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, executive session. So uh, I will entertain a motion to enter into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect, specifically the superintendent. So move. So move. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Hainer, seconded by Mr. Cardin. Roll call vote. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. yes. Ms. Morgan? <laughs> Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. And I vote yes, and we will not be returning to open session at the end of this meeting. <laughs>